Hello, my dear viewers. Now, it's safe to assume most people don't spend their free time reading about Canadian political shenanigans and instead have things like a life and friends. But luckily, I don't have either of those, so I will be spending my free time making this lovely series summarizing the life and history of each PM in chronological order for you all to watch and not have to read. Now, first of the series, of course, is our beloved crippling alcoholic and $10 bill guy, Sir John Alexander MacDonald. Now, some of you may know MacDonald has become uh, controversial in recent years for, let's just say, reasons. But we'll get to those reasons in a bit. Our story begins in Glasgow, Scotland in January 1815, where John was born, the third of five children, to a not-so-successful merchant named Hugh MacDonald. Now, we won't be talking about MacDonald's time in Scotland, since he moved while he was still relatively young, and because this is a biased Canada-centric channel. Now, it might be worth noting that in MacDonald's biography from 1891, the author goes into an odd amount of detail about MacDonald's ancestral line going all the way back to the 13th century in Scotland, talking about a bunch of chieftains, kings, and other nobles doing all types of wacky shenanigans. I'm not sure how this is necessary, but it's there if you ever want to read it. Now, in 1820, while MacDonald was still only five years old, Hugh decided to pack up the whole family and emigrate all the way to Canada after his many, many failed business ventures back in Scotland. Now, of course, Canada at this time was still a pair of sparsely settled colonies, Upper and Lower Canada, which are today Ontario and Quebec. Once arriving in Canada, they would quickly settle in Kingston, one of the few major settlements in British North America at the time. They would also end up living in nearby Quinty Bay, in the small town of Adolphus, but for the most part, they were living in Kingston most of the time while in Canada. From here, MacDonald was put into grammar school, like many boys of his age at the time. He was there until the age of 15, when his father convinced him to study law, and was put in the hands of a prominent local lawyer called George Mackenzie. And after six years of studying law, MacDonald would open his first law office in Kingston in 1835. From here, MacDonald would use his skill and gain much local prominence as a lawyer. But MacDonald would not remain a lawyer for very long, because in the next few years, a major event would occur that would kickstart MacDonald's fast, fast rise into the lovely, lovely world of politics. And this major event would occur in 1837, when the colonies of Upper and Lower Canada, from years of political mismanagement and corruption, sparked into revolt. And the two major leaders of these revolts were Louis Joseph Papineau in Lower Canada and William Lyon Mackenzie in Upper Canada. And side note, the William Lyon Mackenzie here is in fact the grandfather of everyone's favorite schizoid Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, 84 years later. Now I won't be going into details about these rebellions, uh, since this is not the focus of this video, but long story short, they were quickly suppressed by British and Loyalist forces between 1837 and 1838. But they would lead to MacDonald's arguably most famous case as a lawyer. In 1838, a man named Nils von Schultz landed a small group of men from the Hunter's Lodges near Preston, Ontario. They were quickly attacked and surrendered to local British and Loyal's forces, and MacDonald would act in Schultz's defense during his trial. Schultz's defense was essentially that, supposedly, William Lyon Mackenzie had duped Schultz into thinking that the Canadians were more oppressed than they really were under British rule, and that Schultz truly believed he was acting more as a liberator rather than a conqueror, and that the court should take mercy on Schultz for his misguidance. But regardless if this is true or not, it didn't matter as Schultz was still sentenced to death. But MacDonald's oration skills were very well noticed during this trial and it would gain him much much more attention than normal. Or as us autistic zoomers would say, it got him clout. Afterwards, MacDonald would go back to practicing law at his firm. And at this firm, a few prominent future political figures would come to partner with him at his firm. One was Alexander Campbell, a future senator and lieutenant governor of Ontario. And another was Oliver Mowat, the future third premier of Ontario. 
Now, one of the consequences of the aforementioned rebellion was the Act of Union or the British North America Act, which went into effect in 1841. This act would combine both Upper and Lower Canada into a single colony, called the Province of Canada. The new colony would have a legislator split equally between the two halves. Now, one of the intentions of this union was to dilute and weaken French influence by hopefully assimilating them slowly by combining them with the rest of English Canada. This even included banning the French language from the legislator. But most of the anti-French laws were removed in the following years. And we now, of course, obviously know this assimilation of the French didn't work very well. And for now, the capital of the new colony was Kingston, where MacDonald is still living right now. Now, MacDonald didn't decide to get into politics right away, but he would soon. First by attending various different local political meetings, gaining connections, meeting new people, and getting a feel for a parliamentary procedure and how this stuff worked. Now, in 1843, MacDonald did decide to run for office but not for the legislator, for now. Instead, he would run for our local municipality board as a councillor in one of the wards of Kingston. And after that small election, his supporters lifted him up and accidentally dropped him into a pile of slush on the street. But very soon, MacDonald did decide to run for the legislator, and he did so by beating Anthony Monaghan in Kingston. Now between 1844 and 1856, MacDonald would rise through the government, receiving various different positions such as Queen's Counsel, Receiver General, and Attorney General. Also, during this time, MacDonald's wife would have two children, one of which died at 13 months, and the other, named Hugh, would grow up to be the 8th Premier of Manitoba, but very briefly. But also, during this time, she was constantly chronically ill, and would finally die in 1857. Because of these obvious family problems, this is where MacDonald's alcoholism really started to kick in. Anyways, back to MacDonald. In 1856, he would help force joint premier Alan McNeb to resign, and quickly replacing them as premier. MacDonald was now joint ruler with Etienne Pascal Taché as premier. Now for a little bit of context. Throughout the province of Canada's history, the capital had moved quite a bit and would go back and forth between cities like Kingston, Montreal, Toronto, and Quebec City. And by the time MacDonald became premier, the capital was now situated in Toronto. But in 1857, the legislator was making a decision. They were considering moving the capital permanently to Quebec City. Oh, but no, MacDonald was going to have none of that. So he used his position as premier to make the legislator adopt a different proposal. He proposed that Queen Victoria should decide on the new capital, albeit with the advice of Canadian advisors, and under the condition that Quebec City would become the capital for at least another three years. But in the end, Quebec City would remain the capital until 1866. But anyways, by 1858, the decision was made to be Ottawa. Ottawa may have been a relatively minor city by this point, but it was growing fast, and it was situated farther away from the US border than most cities, making it easier to defend from those dastardly Yankees. And it was situated between the two halves of Canada, so hopefully this would lead to some semblance of unity. Tasha would retire in 1857 and be replaced by George Etienne Carter as premier this would leave MacDonald as the senior partner effectively until 1862. MacDonald would have a bit of a tenuous position as premier as he had to largely rely on the French coalition with Cartier to remain in power because he at times struggled with support in his main area of Upper Canada due to support and promotion of certain French legislation like separate Catholic schools from Protestant ones. And although he believed in English-French cooperation in Canada, he did a lot of this largely to keep the French coalition together. Also during this time, the economy was growing, from finance to railroads to natural resources, but politically the colony was more divided than ever, and there was endless deadlock in Parliament. In 1862, while the American Civil War was now going on, there was a concern in Canada and Britain that once the war ended, America might focus its attention northward. Due to this, a militia bill was proposed, in which Canada would be footing the costs for. Now, most of the French Canada and their legislators opposed this, as they thought that this would lead to French Canadians paying and fighting for a mostly British-centric war. MacDonald was supposed to speak in defense of this bill and to keep the French coalition together on it. But he was shit-faced drunk this entire time and failed to show up for much of the parliamentary meetings on it. Due to this, his entire government fell and got replaced by the Liberals under John Sandfield MacDonald, no relation. But don't worry, our MacDonald would be back by 1864, where he would remain. 
In 1864, George Brown and others were getting fed up with the endless deadlock and instability in government, so they requested a meeting with McDonald privately to discuss a permanent solution to it. So, they met in the St. Louis Hotel in Quebec City. One of Brown's biggest concerns was representation by population, as the legislature was split between the two halves of Canada equally. One of McDonald's biggest desires was a united British North America. Now, uniting all the British colonies of North America into a single entity had been talked about for years prior to this, but this is now one of the more serious attempts at it. They finally all agreed that a federation between the colonies might be the best attempt at breaking the deadlock and instability in government. They agreed to form a great coalition under McDonald's conservatives and the liberal grits. McDonald would remain leader and many of the liberal leaders, including Brown, would become cabinet members for this goal. Also during this time, the maritime colonies of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island were planning a conference to discuss a possible maritime union. Newfoundland too, but they couldn't attend in time, lol. Now this conference was supposed to be held in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island in September. Seeing an opportunity, Canada requested that it send its own delegates to discuss a broader union between the colonies, in which of course, the maritime colonies accepted. Canada would send eight delegates to represent them. John A. Macdonald himself, George Brown, George Etienne Cartier, Alexander Tillich Galt, Hector Louis Langevin, William McDougall, Thomas Darcy McGee, and John Ross. And here are the maritime delegates, which I'm too lazy to read. And in September, when the conference was supposed to be held in Charlottetown, there was actually a circus growing through the city at the time, and it made finding hotel accommodations quite difficult for many of the delegates, and some of them actually stayed on the boat. At the discussions, the idea of a maritime union was quickly overshadowed by the Canadian delegates and McDonald's discussions of a broader British North America Union, in which most of the delegates were supportive of the idea, with Prince Edward Island being the most skeptical. Eventually, they agreed to hold another conference in Halifax and Quebec City to hammer out the potential details. Quebec City in October, all the colonial delegates attended, except for Newfoundland, which sent two observers instead. And one of these observers, Ambrose Shi, was uh, supportive of Confederation, but the people back in Newfoundland were not so happy about him saying that. In the conference, they would have the 72 resolutions, which would form the basis of the later Canadian Constitution, in which MacDonald was the architect of about 50 of them. Now, MacDonald wanted a strong central government, believing that disputes between local and federal authority lead to endless disputes and chaos, even setting the American Civil War as an example of what happens when you have a weak central government. But now, obviously, since most of the regions still wanted their own level of autonomy, there's no way in hell MacDonald was ever going to get something like this passed, so it was agreed that the government would be split between the federal and local. Each provincial government would have its own legislature, which would handle local matters like infrastructure, language, education, and a lot of other boring stuff. The federal government would assume provincial debt, control trade, criminal justice, and national infrastructure. The new confederation would have a lower house made up of elected officials from each province by population and an appointed upper house senate with 24 members from each classified region, Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes. And finally, the federal government could redraw the federal electoral districts after a census if need be. In 1866, delegates were sent to London to formalize the agreement, and with only Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland refusing, Queen Victoria gave her approval, and the Confederation went into effect on July 1st, 1867. Now, how big of an impact MacDonald had on these negotiations has been debated by historians since, well, forever. MacDonald liked to sort of brag privately that he was the sole and biggest reason that Confederation existed, now, while that is quite questionable, it is true that MacDonald was definitely one of the leading and most influential figures during these negotiations. It is now election time! And as expected, McDonald's Conservatives won a decent majority of 100 seats out of 181. Now, if you look at the map, you might notice something a little odd down in the Maritimes. You see, by this time, the Maritimes still had quite a bit of anti-Confederation sentiment, and in Nova Scotia, that sentiment was led by Joseph Howey with the Anti-Confederation Party. In fact, only one pro-Confederation candidate actually won a seat in Nova Scotia, and that was Charles Tupper in Cumberland. And in 1868, Joseph Howe would lead a delegation to London to try and get Britain to repeal Nova Scotia's entry into Confederation, which they refused. In 1869, 
Howe was made part of McDonald's cabinet under the agreement that Nova Scotia's terms of the Confederation would be re-examined. They reached an agreement that the federal government would assume $9 million in Nova Scotia's debt instead of $8 million like was previous. Now back to McDonald. The first order of business as PM was the construction of the Intercolonial Railway, which would connect the maritime provinces to the rest of Canada, which would be fully completed by 1876. Second big thing to do was to try and acquire more territory, as there was a constant fear that America might try to manifest destiny its way up north, so the goal was to try and unify all of British North America as fast as possible from sea to sea. By 1869, the Macdonald government would manage to negotiate a deal to buy Rupert's land from the Hudson Bay Company for £300,000, and the company would, of course, keep 20% of farmland. Although there was a small problem, the Matisse people, who were mixed race French Catholics that populated the Red River Colony, now southern Manitoba, were like, Hey, Mr. Government Man, are you gonna, you gotta consult us? We, we kind of live on this land as well. To which everyone was like, Ho ho ho. No. So they revolted under a man named Louis Rael, but this was a mostly bloodless revolt. They declared a local provisional government and seized Fort Gary and demanded the government negotiate terms with before entry into the Dominion, which the government was willing to do. Although, in 1870, they executed a pro-Canadian man named Thomas Scott for just being a nuisance in jail, essentially. And although this didn't stop their negotiations with the Canadian government, it did make sure the government wouldn't guarantee amnesty for the rebellion leaders. Eventually, in 1870, the Manitoba Act was agreed. The Matisse people would receive titles for their land they owned, the French language would be protected in government and education, and the Red River Colony would enter confederation as the province of Manitoba. Although the land titles would only be issued after the land was surveyed and the Matisse were given a land script, which was basically an IOU card, which just created a whole other list of problems that we're not going to talk about right now. Troops were then sent into the area to assert government authority, and Rael had worried they'd imprison or kill him for his role in the rebellion and Scott's execution fled to America. Also, during this time, from debt, British unity, and worry of American annexation, the colony of British Columbia were in negotiations with the Confederation, and by 1871, with the promise of assuming debt and a transcontinental railway, they agreed to join the Dominion. Also in 1871, a five-man commission of men from America, Britain, and Canada was created to settle various disputes. MacDonald was the one Canadian on this commission. From 1871 to 1872, Britain and America settled various disputes at the Treaty of Washington, in which MacDonald was part of the five-man commission. The biggest dispute was the damages caused by the British-built Confederate warship, the CSS Alabama. It was settled with Britain paying $15.5 million in damages caused by its attacks on American shipping. Other parts of the treaty allowed Americans to use Canadian waters for fishing for 12 years in exchange for $5.5 million and Canadian fish getting free access to American markets. The San Juan Islands, which is a small archipelago near Vancouver Island, was disputed between BC and the US. It was decided that German Emperor Wilhelm I would settle the dispute. He decided in favor of America, awarding the entire archipelago to them. Finally, Britain would grant a loan to Canada for the construction of the Transcontinental Railway. The treaty would come into effect by 1873. Now, it's clear that Canada got the short end of the stick when it came to this treaty, and it was popular with basically no one. The Canada being the subject of Britain, gave MacDonald not much of a choice but to pass this treaty. Its unpopularity was especially apparent in the 1872 election, when MacDonald's conservatives just barely won and mostly saving face with that railway loan. Although another big reason for MacDonald's re-election was the generous donation from Sir Hugh Allen of around $350,000. This would quickly though come to bite MacDonald in the ass, because prior to the election it was decided that the Transcontinental Rail would be owned by a privately formed company. And there are two main competitors to get the government contract to build the rail, Sir Hugh Allen and David Lewis Macpherson. Now, both had some connections to American business, but MacPherson had more rumors about it, so to potentially eliminate American influence, it was decided that both their companies would be amalgamated for this rail, but this idea was quickly falling through from divide between them. By the 1872 election, the McDonald campaign was desperate for extra cash, so he, uh, Cartier, yes Cartier, I've been pronouncing his name wrong up until now, shut up, I'm not fixing it, and Langevin went out trying to find a source of funds. They got Sir Hugh Allen to donate hundreds of thousands, but McDonald would only promise that Allen would be at least president 
of the hypothetical company. Cartier would promise that Allen would get the contract and a majority stock in the new company in exchange for large funds. After the election, Allen was given the contract, but by early April 1873, Liberal MP Lucius Huntington had exposed a series of leaked papers that were stolen from his lawyer, John Abbott. Now, the thing about John Abbott is that he would become Prime Minister after McDonald's death in 1891. That's for later. The papers were the corresponding messages between Allen, the McDonald cabinet, and his business associates. In it, they revealed the McDonald government was guilty of taking money in exchange for the contract, and American money was used by Allen to fund McDonald's campaign. An investigation was launched into the situation. Since party funding wasn't exactly very regulated, McDonald would argue that there isn't anything wrong with receiving private funds since they were being used for the campaign and not himself. And to be fair, there was legitimate election expenses, but regardless of any legal gray area, it was still seen as incredibly inappropriate to take this money from a person in direct negotiation with an important contract. And there's still the matter that much of this money was from American sources, although McDonald would claim he didn't know that part at the time. Another more unofficial reason for why McDonald was so easy to basically bribe during this time was that he was in a ton of debt, and I mean a lot, about 80000 by 1869, which would be well over $2 million today. And much of this debt was owed to the Merchant Bank of Canada, whose president and founder just so happened to be Hugh Allen. So, uh, make of that what you will. In the end, McDonald and his government would resign on November 5th, 1873, and be replaced by the liberal Alexander Mackenzie, who scheduled a new election for January the next year. But unfortunately for Mackenzie, this period would be dominated by the Global Depression, largely out of his control for the next five years. And it would lead to the cancellation of the railway contract and be replaced by a government program to build the rail instead. But it only managed to complete 710 miles during this period. I didn't know that properly segue into this, but also in 1873, McDonald's right-hand man, George Etienne Cartier, yes, I finally pronounced his name correctly, I'm not fixing all the other times, died of Bright's disease in May, and in July, Prince Edward Island would finally join Confederation after a failed railway project left the province completely bankrupt and asked to join Confederation under a series of financial terms. During this relatively brief time in opposition, not much of note would happen for McDonald besides contemplating his future in politics and occasionally thinking of resigning as party leader. He would quickly sell his Ottawa home and get a new place in Toronto to be close to his law firm and then also had some internal changes and drama with his business partners which is too boring to talk about so I won't. There was one kind of funny incident that happened to him in February 1875 where he got plastered on brandy in Parliament and had to give a speech, very drunk. And afterwards, when Alexander Mackenzie came to speak in the House, he just kept interrupting him the entire time. On March 10th, 1876, he would give his speech outlining his broad national policy in Parliament, which would call for a system of high tariffs on foreign manufactured goods, infrastructure building, and Western expansion. All these things were decently popular in Canada at the time, especially the railroad. In 1877, McDonald told Langevin that he wanted to resign as party leader, since his health was in question and wasn't sure if he was cut out for it anymore. Langevin, can I resign please? Cring. With an election next year and the McKenzie government declining in popularity, the party essentially refused to let him resign. <laughs> And in September 1878, it's election time once again. Not surprisingly, the Conservative Party under McDonald would win a decisive victory. But interestingly, McDonald lost his own riding in Kingston by a narrow margin. But he was cautious enough to put himself on the ballot for three ridings in total. Not exactly common, but was an acceptable practice for some party leaders at the time. He had put himself on the ballot for three ridings, one in Kingston, one in Manitoba, and one in Victoria, BC. He would win the other two, and he would choose to end up representing the one from BC. Now back in charge, McDonald would get started on these promises almost immediately in early 1879. For the new economy, Samuel Leonard Tilley was appointed as the new Minister of Finance and was in charge of working on the new protectionist policy making. While some people, including the Governor General John Campbell, wanted a British preference on these policies, i.e. giving British goods a free entry or at least a significantly lower tariff than other nations, and while neither MacDonald or Tilly were opposed to giving Britain special treatment in principle, 
However, there was a real concern of the American retaliation tariff response due to the Yankee worry of Britain using Canada to loophole their way around American tariffs on British goods. And Tilly was especially worried about a large American tariff on things like lumber in New Brunswick. So it was ultimately decided that these new policies would, for now, apply to all outside goods. A small issue, though, was Britain's response to these policies. Donald knew Britain wouldn't be happy with them and would voice their disapproval, but was confident they would still accept it. But just in case, he did submit his policies to the colonial office. And by telegram to the Governor General, got his response just two days before Tilly would have to give his budget speech to the House. The response was as expected, unhappy both in Canada's jurisdiction to the side. The average general tariff rate on most things would go from 17.5% to 20%. For the continued railroad dream, Charles Tupper would be appointed as Minister of a new position, Ministry of Railways and Canals, and he'd oversee the construction of the Continental Railway. And since the West was such a, an important project to MacDonald, he himself took on the position of Minister of the Interior until 1883. The railway would start construction from two locations, from the east end to the west, and the federal government was looking for contractors for the western half in 1879 and hired Andrew Underdonk, an American construction contractor, to build the BC portions of the rail, which started on May 15, 1880. On October 21st, the eastern portion of the rail was contracted to a Montreal-based rail syndicate not connected to Hugh Allen, made up of multiple backers that would form the new Canadian Pacific Rail Company. The primary unofficial leaders of the group at the time were Donald Alexander Smith, the man that was sent to negotiate with Louis Riel during the Red River Rebellion, and his cousin, George Stephan, who was the president of the Bank of Montreal. The contract for this project was going through Parliament in the winter of 1880 to 1881, where MacDonald would successfully defend his decision for it in Parliament, but late in March, shortly after the Parliament session ended, his health would take a sudden nosedive, and while MacDonald had suffered from periods of poor health before, this time it was far more serious than normal. His heart rate dropped to 49 BPM and suffered serious pains in his liver and abdomen. The personal doctor was even worried about the possibility of it being cancer. Now, I'm no doctor, but at 66, if your heart rate drops to 49 BPM, it's uh, not good. Meanwhile, the new CPR Corporation was formally formed on February 16th, 1881, and it was promised to complete the rail by 1891. But McDonald's illness would last through much of the year, so much so he and his family decided to temporarily travel to England to get rest and better care. He left for England in late May of that year. While in England, he would regularly meet with different British political associates at dinners and discuss things, and even wanted to discuss a plan with British Prime Minister William Gladstone to get more British migration to Canada. But in the end, not much of political significance would happen. He would mostly just do fancy people leisure stuff and would head back to Canada in early September. The biggest thing of note from this entire ordeal was that this seemed to have been the point where McDonald realized if he wanted to see through his political ambitions, he needed to take better care of his health, as he was by now 66, and he did. This is the point where McDonald had seemed to finally stop being a chronic alcoholic, and good thing too, since next year, the June 1882 election went pretty much exactly as expected. McDonald and the Conservative Party won a predictable majority. With a majority parliament and better health, McDonald could finally focus on the completion of his railway dreams. And I mean really wanted it. He spent a lot to get it done. $25 million, 25 million acres of land along the lines of the rail. Land survey costs would wind up being $27 million. No other line was allowed to be built southwards into the U.S. or southwest for 20 years although the no more line southwest part was removed in 1887, but anyways, and property tax exempt for 20 years, and the transfer of the sections of the line that were built during the McKenzie government. But even more money was required by 1884, and McDonald gave them an additional $22.5 million with the Railway Relief Bill. The rail was finally completed on November 7th, 1885, nearly six years ahead of schedule. In total, the cost of the project when calculated in modern dollars was close to, if not over, $2 billion. Oh boy, now for the most uh, controversial stuff. The real spicy shit. The stuff that's gotten McDonald's reputation a bit uh, tattered in recent years. McDonald and the natives. Indigenous, First Nations, Aboriginal, whatever. They all mean the same thing in this context. Anyways, in 1876, the McKenzie government signed the Indian Act, which was a set of laws relating to various tribes and how the government was supposed to interact and administer them. 
usually involving various treaties and agreements from even before Confederation and onwards, especially in regards to reserved lands, which were promised by the original 1867 Constitution. This act is still around today, but has obviously been amended a lot over the years. The way MacDonald viewed the natives was kind of parent-child way, but not in the, uh, you know, le wholesome, I love my kid, I'll do anything for them, more of the reluctant step-parent that's just kind of obligated to deal with them. In 1880, the now MacDonald government created the Department of Indian Affairs, which was used to manage and administer First Nations-related stuff and enforce rules, laws, or obligations from treaties. Uh, didn't go so well to say the least, but let's just go over a few major things that, that would happen throughout the 1880s relating to the natives. The first and possibly biggest one that you'll hear about today is the residential school system, a school system designed to assimilate the native children into the broader Anglo-French culture. It also created a lot of problems. Of course, this is another long, complicated topic, so we'll have to summarize again, which I'll quickly explain in the shittiest, most oversimplified way possible. Hey there, Mr. Nicholas Davin, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Journalist, and later defense for the guy who killed George Brown. <clears throat> so I hear those Yankees, those silly Americans, they have a new type of school system for their native population. Now I want you to go down there and write me a report about it. All right. Oh my god, Mr. Prime Minister, it's awesome. We should totally do that and have the church administer it. What could go wrong? It's important to note that it wasn't mandatory for any native children to go to any school until 1898. And these schools specifically weren't mandatory until 1920. The real peak of the residential school system would be in the 1930s, but that's that's for another day. Also, by the 1880s, the situation at West wasn't looking so fresh for many natives and Métis. The mass hunting of the buffalo for industrial use had obliterated the local food supply for many of these communities, and any that could farm had to deal with widespread crop failures that were being caused by a sudden change in the climate. Many on the brink of famine or financial ruin were getting desperate. And the Department of Indian Affairs was in many ways making the problems worse. Some of the agreements and the treaties did promise food or supplies. However, the department under Lawrence Vaucnet kept trying to cut costs to the department, which typically involved cutting ration supplies or outright denying them. And sometimes when food supplies did arrive, it would be spoiled and inedible. And sometimes the department would use withholding rations as a way to get tribes to follow their orders. This eventually all boiled over into one big event the Northwest Rebellion, which took place in late March to early June of 1885 in the territories of what is now Saskatchewan, just before the rail was fully complete. This was actually two separate rebellions, one by the Métis, who had largely migrated out west, and the second by the local Plains Cree. So now the Métis were not covered under the Indians Act or under the jurisdiction of the department, so were entitled to land reserves or rations. However, they could vote though, so that's something neat, I guess. They did want some kind of agreement with the government to at least guarantee the lands they were now on. The Métis would send a scouting team into Montana and bring back their lord and savior Louis Riel from his self-imposed exile. So, a side note, I just want to say by this time Riel had kind of gone insane. Like, he was really weird. If I ever make a separate video about him, I'll go into more detail about the strange things he said. Anyways, many letters have been sent to the federal government with very little reply, but they did say in the next year they conduct a census for them on the land. But this wasn't enough, as the situation was going to shit. So under Riel, they had formed the Saskatchewan Provisional Government at Batash. And after some success against the local Northwest Mounted Police, the Cree decided to rebel as well. Now the details of the war battles aren't important as it's not the focus here, but using some of the completed sections of the CPR, the government quickly sent their own troops and overwhelmed them with superior numbers and weapons. And the aftermath was what's important here. For the Plains tribes, rations were somewhat increased afterwards, but Indian Affairs would now essentially ban travel of First Nations people from the reserves in the West unless given special permission. And the Métis were again awarded land titles through the Métis script thing again, which still didn't go well as most didn't really understand the market value of their land and would be swindled into selling it for far less by prospectors. But one of the biggest immediate ramifications for MacDonald and his government was the execution of Riel. French Canada was furious, English Canada was delighted, and no matter what, one side was going to be mad with nothing MacDonald could really do. 
and this was one of the first big rifts between English and French Canada. And the effects would be immediate, as the Quebec wing of the Conservative Party would be unseated in the Quebec general election next year in 1886. And another incidental consequence of the rebellion was the alteration of a piece of legislation that MacDonald was put through Parliament in January of 1885, right before the rebellion. The Electoral Franchise Act, which was supposed to give a uniform system of voting qualifications and, and other boring stuff you don't care about, but some of the provisions would have given property-owning widows the right to vote and status Indians. But after the rebellion, it was changed to not allow any status Indians west of Ontario to vote. So, yeah. And this brings me to the 1887 general election. The service still won an overall majority again, but due to the rift from the Riel controversy, lost the hold of Quebec to the Liberals, which had been a conservative stronghold for most of Macdonald's history up until now. Another event that occurred in Parliament in 1889 was Macdonald and future Prime Minister Wilfred Laurier uniting to defeat a motion in Parliament that was trying to get the federal government to overturn the Jesuits' Estate Act, enacted by the Parliament of Quebec the previous year, which essentially was financial compensation to the Catholic Church for the confiscation of Jesuit estates by the British in 1774. This angered some of the more aggressive Protestants in Ontario and in the Conservative Party. So they asked the Minister of Justice and also future Prime Minister, John Thompson, if the federal government would overturn it. When they refused, they brought the motion to Parliament. MacDonald was able to successfully keep his party united and not split down sectarian lines, and the motion only had 13 MPs who voted in favor. But to try and appease the Protestants the next year, in 1890, Parliament would allow the Protestant organization Orange Order of Canada to be incorporated. These events, however, did cause more tensions between English and French Canada, but that that would be a future leader's problem to manage. By early 1891, there were allegations of corruption in the Department of Public Works between Langevin and the contractor Thomas McGreevy. The details of the scandal aren't important right now, but it did entice MacDonald to call an election before the next Parliament session where the opposition could get a chance to make it a big deal. The election would take place on March 5th, and MacDonald would campaign on his patriotism for Britain, which Anglo-Canada considered themselves an extension of. I am a British subject and British born, and a British subject I hope to die. And of course, his previous national policy in contrast to the Liberals calls for free trade of America, which many saw as a risk to Canadian sovereignty. He'd win a slightly smaller majority, but still would lose in Quebec. On May 12th, while talking with the Governor General, Frederick Stanley, MacDonald had another stroke. This didn't completely disable him, but it was signifying the end. He'd continue in office as his health would slowly decline. He'd continue with paperwork and small meetings until May 29th when he suffered a far more severe stroke that left him disabled until finally passing away a week later on June 6th. The immediate aftermath caused a small crisis in the conservative cabinet as who would succeed him. Governor General Lord Stanley asked the Minister of Justice John Thompson to form a government in his place. Thompson declined due to political concerns about him being a Catholic. He instead recommended the respected John Abbott, which Abbott reluctantly agreed in order to keep his party together. And this is where MacDonald's story reaches its end. MacDonald had been Prime Minister just a week short of 19 years, and that doesn't include his years in office in pre-Confederation Canada. His body would be buried in Cataraqui Cemetery in his adoptive home city of Kingston. In his time, he took British North America from a couple of politically divided Anglo and French colonies into a rapidly developing nation stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and prevented the complete American annexation of the North. And while MacDonald's long-term goals were to turn Anglo-Canada into Britain 2.0, his leadership still played a crucial role in modern Canada even existing at all. So despite his controversies and mistakes, he's still one of the most important figures in Canadian history, and for that, deserves to be remembered in our national mythos of figures. And with that, this concludes this video, which took way too long to make because I kept having to delay it for various reasons. But if you made it this far, I'd greatly appreciate it if you subscribed and tried to spam this into the algorithm so my hours and hours doing this shit doesn't go to waste. With that, I'm out.